So I'm so glad to be with you again today. And uh, yes, well, so Birgit suggested the topics change yourself to change the world. As you can imagine, that's a big agenda and we don't know where to start <laughs> because it <laughs> seems a bit overwhelming. There's a lot to change in ourselves and there's certainly a lot to change in the world. So where do we start? Well, um, actually, you know, human societies are made of individuals. So some people will argue, let's change the institution. But if the individual don't change, that's not going to work. So let's try to unravel uh, this and see how eff effectively individual change can lead to changing the world. Um, just as a preliminary, once I met a very well-known and respected French philosopher, uh, when I was writing the book on altruism. And he said, you know, Matthew, all this thing about meditation, you're not going to change anything uh, because we are the same human being as Aristotle. He thought that slavery was a good thing for society. You know, 100 people working for a thousand, that's a good deal. And uh, we are the same human beings. Now the institutions have changed and everybody would say slavery has been abolished. So, you know, he was a very smart mind. So uh, on the spot, I didn't know what to answer. But later on, when I reflected on what he said, uh, it seemed to me that, uh, well, we didn't change uh, genetically. We have the same emotion, the same genes, like 2,000 years ago. The only genes in human that changed over the last 40,000 years is a gene about metabolizing lactose. You know, no big deal. And certainly no impact on altruism. <laughs> so what did change? And uh, well, culture certainly changed, but also individual did change because now today, we know what we know about modern science, especially, if you're born in a society where from the very early age, you are told about respect of others, no matter what their creed, their gender, their race, their uh, and that everyone, you know, the universal declaration of human rights, the abolition of slavery, at least officially, the abolition of torture, at least officially, certainly a lot of change. So someone who grows up in that uh, sort of with those ideas from early childhood, um, we know now that the brain of that person will be will change also and even the epigenetics of that person is the gene of that person will express differently so actually we will be different individuals and so there's also a, a whole science about the evolution of cultures and uh, if they follow a darwinian system but they go much faster than genes actually there's a book called faster than genes by two main researcher on that field. And they found that uh, culture can change over a generation, two generations, a century. Uh, if you look at our attitude uh, towards women, towards children, although there's still a lot to do, or even towards war. In the 19th century, uh, it was said that war is the melting pot of civilization, you know. Of course, there are still a lot of wars, unfortunately, coming from, you know, bloody dictators and insane people, but nobody is praising war as a melting pot of civilization. So culture did change, uh, like the, our attitude towards the environment has changed. You know, when I was a teenager, I was a bird watcher and uh, the book of Russell Carson, Silent Spring, it was one of the first book who alerted people about the degradation of the environment and the loss of biodiversity. You know, we were a group of bird watchers, but it has no, it has some impact, but very minimal. Now, the question of the environment is at the forefront of many discussion. We know we're probably heading towards three degrees. That will be major, major suffering in the world in terms of conflict, in terms of famine and so forth. Uh, so there has been change, you know, attitude towards tobacco. You know, most people, you know, it has been mostly forbidden in many places, took time of a generation. 
And then this is transmitted to education, to example from parents to children and so forth. And those people who have been educated in a new culture, they will make new institutions. So basically, it has to start also with, human, with personal change. And when personal change reaches a kind of critical mass of people who have a strong ID, then culture change, institution change. And then that's going on from generation to generation in a cumulative way. Uh, to give the example of the abolition of slavery in England at the end of the 18th century, you know, a group of re respected people, about 10 of them, said, you know, slavery cannot go on. You know, it's totally immoral. But then, you know, most of the House of Commons, they say, well, what are you talking about? You know, the whole British Empire economy will collapse without slavery. So they completely dismissed it. But because that was a strong ID and with a moral background, 10 years later, slavery was actually abolished. Uh, I met uh, when Stefan Essel, when he met, he came to see his own the Dalai Lama in France. He was 90 years old. He was one of the 10 people who crafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So here, 10 people had this strong idea, they, they put it in action, and eventually, although it's not perfect, but still, it's something that did incredible good to humanity. There is well known also in communities where there are, you know, antiquated ideas that are like terrible, like women excision in Africa. If we can change, uh, you know, the idea of a few village leaders or strong women who manage to create a tipping point in the culture, then some some of those terrible practices can be abolished. So, like in our work in Nepal, for instance in very uh, poor villages at the border of India, near Lumbini and Kapilavistu, the places of Lord Buddha, for instance, there is hardly any toilet. And uh, so women have a lot of difficulty, you know, to go to toilet in the, in the forest and so forth. So now if we motivate uh, village women, uh, they become so enthusiastic and strong and they convince everyone, including their husband and everything that we, we need that. So individual change can lead to change in society, then we change of institution and just gradually change the world. But you know, it's, it has to start with personal change. And to give an example, you know, if you want to make a beautiful garden of flowers, you cannot say, well, if the flowers are withered or dry or not looking beautiful, you say, well, if you put many of them, uh, it will look nice. It will not. It's only if you have all fresh, beautiful, fragrant flowers, if you put many of them, then you get a beautiful garden. So there has to be this kind of personal change. This is at the root of changing society. An institution alone cannot change people. You know, as the Sri Dalai Lama often says, you can force people action. You know, you can deprive them of free of freedom. You can deprive them of the freedom of speech as well. But to change the mind, it has to come from within. It has to, you have to decide yourself to change our mind. Otherwise, you know, if you think only it comes from the top down, you know, it's like, you know, authoritarian and totalitarian system. My late father, the French philosopher Jean-François Rovel said what those authoritarian uh, system tell you is we know how to make you happy. You only have to do what we say. And if you don't like it, we have to eliminate you. That's basically the motto. So that also doesn't work. So now, as let's say how we start with the individual change. So first of all, is it desirable? And is it possible? So desirable, well, once I met in Hong Kong at a dinner, someone, it was, I think, a businessman, he said, well, everything is absolutely perfect in my life. I don't want to change anything in what I am and the circumstances around me. Wow. So I told that to one of my teachers. He said, either he's enlightened or he's crazy. 
So I think, <laughs> I'm not sure he was enlightened. So we are definitely a mixture of light and shadows. That's our starting point. Nothing wrong with that. That's where we are. Now, can we change? That's the whole point. Some people said, no, you know, that's what make my special personality. You know, in the, especially in North America, they say you are so special. They will keep on telling you, you are so special and everyone mm -hmm. is so different. And so the hyper individualistic society make everyone is special with their quality and defect and take it or leave it. I don't want to change and there's nothing to change. But that's not very uh, encouraging for becoming a better person. So if we look uh, sincerely in our mind, you know, suppose we gather today uh, on a kind of seminar and with the guarantee that at the end you will be 100% more jealous, proud, and angry. You know, who's going to come, frankly speaking? So we know it's not so good. And then we know it would be better if we are less suffer from jealousy, from resentment, from you know, arrogance, from craving. Somehow we know it's a little bit better. Some people say, well, life will be very boring. I think your great uh, uh, thinker, Goethe, said once that three days of uninterrupted happiness will be unbearable because it's always the same. And so suffering, you know, is ups and downs and it's so colorful and so many things happen. But frankly speaking, if you are sitting say in a beautiful landscape with, beauty, with wonderful friends or in a very serene place, say, oh, I am missing the emergency room. I'm missing the you know, revolution and all that. I don't think so, really, frankly speaking. So we know instinctively that if somehow we could override or diminish our tendency for blowing the fuse, uh, being nagged by jealousy, sometimes, you know, feeling resentment for a long time, all those mental toxins that Buddhism and, and describe in great detail. And uh, also we, we find in modern psychology. So I think if it was possible, we would be much better off. I mean, who, yes, I think who would not want to be free from those uh, sort of mental states. Uh, in the actual word in Tibetan, new monk, it means something that sort of disturbs the mind and also that obscures the mind. Because when we are uh, you know, in a great state of anger, uh, our judgment is completely obscured. Uh, we see the object of our anger as 100% despicable and we believe that those terrible quality belong intrinsically to that person. Yeah. And then we may change completely from one day to the other. So it's mostly projection of our own mind. So, yes, so it would be somehow better if we could find a little bit of inner freedom. So now, it is desirable, but is it possible? That's the main question. Some people say, well, no, you know, it's so deeply ingrained in human nature that uh, you cannot get rid of that. It's like from the birth, it's engraved in stone, uh, you know, and that's it. And uh, you can fight against it, but maybe better not. it's better not to fight because then you're fighting against yourself. It's not very healthy. So you must accept what you are and go about your life in the best possible way. And some people say, oh, we already have so much to do facing the circumstances of life. It's on top of that, we have to deal with our mind, try to change it, you know, that's too much. Well, well, now first, is it possible at all? So that's where, you know, the contemplative or introspective perspective uh, is important. Because it, um, all those disturbing, you know, mental state, afflictive mental state. Uh, they are the product of our mind. It's like uh, the mind sort of fabricate that. You know, you get a first thought. Why me? Why not me? Why did he say that? Why did he dare to do that? And that single thought, which is like a spark, 
Like if it falls on the heap of dry grass, then it sets things in fire. Then from one thought, there's two thoughts, four thoughts, eight thoughts, and it's completely fill up your mental landscape. And then you almost powerless to deal with this full blown anger, resentment, jealousy, or whatever. So we may say, well, there's nothing I can do. But if we look in the deepest aspect of that, what makes possible all those thought of you no know, negative thought, but also compassion, loving kindness, you know, inner peace, confidence, resilience, all those good qualities that come together to bring a, a healthy state of mind, an optimal state of mind that give you the resources to deal with the ups and downs of life and gradually, you know, you go from being entangled in suffering, from gradually freeing yourself from the causes of suffering, achieving inner freedom, and according to the Buddhist path, you can eventually go to a full-blown wisdom, unconditional compassion, and what, you know, we call enlightenment or awakening or human perfection. So, um, if you look deep within, within the mind, and that requires what we call also first person perspective. And if you go down and down and down, what do you see at the end? You see why well, you don't find neurons. Of course, I know I have neurons. Someone told me, they told me even I have a brain. I didn't know that so far because you don't feel the brain and you don't see the neurons. But the neuroscientist friend tell me, yes, you do have a brain. But when I look within my mind, I don't come to neurons. What do I come in the end? The most basic aspect of the mind. That's pure, uh, the pure faculty of knowing. You know, like uh, if you have a torchlight and if you uh, direct it to a heap of garbage, light doesn't become dirty. If you light up a, a heap of gold, light doesn't become expensive or precious. Light just reveals. It is not modified by what it's lighting up. So there has to be a basic quality of mind that is not conditioned by any of those mental events. Otherwise, say, if anger was intrinsic to the mind, it's like having a, a red torch. Whatever you shine, it is red. So you will see anger everywhere or jealousy everywhere or compassion everywhere. Who knows? So in order to accommodate all these states of mind, which are often contradictory, because you cannot wish at the same time, in the same moment, to have the same person, wish that person harm or wish that person good. Those are incompatible, like heat and cold. So the mind allows all those mental constructs, but the fundamental nature of mind is just the pure cognition. We call that the basic nature of mind, the fundamental nature of mind, sometimes the luminous nature of mind. Luminous because it allows knowing, not because it throws light everywhere, but it compared to an inanimate object that has zero cognitive faculty, the mind is luminous because it allows us to perceive the world and to perceive our own experience, our own thoughts, and eventually what is behind the screen of those thoughts, which is pure awareness. So because this is the most fundamental nature of mind, that is the very reason why we can change the content. Because the basis, the fundamental nature of mind is never changed. Sometimes we can relate that to the concept of Buddha nature. And in the scriptures, he said Buddha nature is like a nugget of gold. Even it has been hundreds of years trapped in the rock or falling in the mud. Gold is gold. It's not degraded when it's fallen in the mud. It's not improved when you pick it up and wash it up and make it shine. You just reveal it. So if that is the case, then change is possible. So, and I know, no, no, Buddhism like images. So there are quite a few images. I gave you the one of the light that is not modified by what it uh, lights up. But we could give, for example, the example of a glass of very pure water. 
no H2O. So it's neither toxic nor medicinal, but you can put some medicine in it or you can put some cyanide in it. So in one case, if you drink it, you die. Second case, if you drink it, you may cure from this, some disease. But water itself has not changed, is the content. So you can filter the water, you can distill the water, you can do all kinds of things. And if you distill the water, you get again pure H2O. There's no more poison, no more medicine. So the basic nature of mind allows all that. So that's why uh, from Buddhist perspective, change is always possible. And that's a good news. Now, <laughs> once it's possible, then we have to put in action the means to do so. So that's why mind training comes in to somehow enhance the wholesome quality that we have for which we have the potential and to somehow uh, diminish the unwholesome uh, aspect of our mind that cause suffering to others, cause suffering to ourselves, And uh, because again, nature of mind is free from those, basic fundamentally, it is possible to deal with the content. Like the, we have the pure sky and sometimes there are clouds of all forms, of all kinds, but you can blow off the clouds and you can, because you know that there's a sky is always there behind and you just have to remove the clouds. So, what we call meditation in Sanskrit, uh, it comes from a word called bhavana, which means to cultivate. In Tibetan, gom means to become familiar with something. So it could be to cultivate a particular quality, like focused attention, or alt altruistic love, or compassion, or inner strength, inner resilience, or to become familiar with the process, how the mind works, how thought arise, how do they multiply, how we can let them arise, but avoid that they multiply, not running after them, not ruminating the past, not anticipating the future, but of remaining in the freshness of this present moment and so forth. So that's uh, become a familiarity with the way the mind works and with the ultimate nature of mind. So that's all, everything, all that falls under what we call meditation. It's not simply, you know, if you tell someone I'm training, so we are waiting for the what follows up. Are you training in in football, in chess, in the where well, training is training? So meditation means a way training the mind. So what are you training? So you may train in the wrong thing. You know, people are conditioned to kill sometimes. Like in Africa, in Uganda, they were young children. They were trained them to kill, and then they became reckless killers. So you can also train people. Uh, for the wrong thing and they will change their brain will change there will be different human beings and that's uh, of course tragic but you can also train your mind in a wholesome way so that's the whole part and buddhism as you know we said there's eighty four thousand entry doors to the buddhism because we have so many mental disposition in the world everyone is somehow different but if we give another image you know if you want to go on top of mount everest you could start from, from Hamburg, you can start from Tokyo, from the North Pole, from the South Pole. So all those paths will be different. So that's different approaches. But when you come at the top, you're all on top of the Everest. And there's much too many people there now, by the way. So, but in terms of enlightenment, there's no problem of uh, no congestion at the top. <laughs> there's no limitation of numbers if you can get there. So that means that Everyone will follow different path, but the ultimate goal is completely removing all what obscures our cause delusion, confusion, our addiction to the cause of suffering. So we we'll remedy to the very root of suffering, which is basically basic ignorance. Then that expresses itself in all those mental toxins, and then you will let. Uh, we know the word in Tibetan, Sangye for Buddha. Sang means to clear all that has to be cleared, all the obscuration, all the causes of ignorance, suffering, anger, pride, and so forth. And Gye means to bloom, to develop, to fully bloom the flower of wisdom, of compassion in completely unlimited way. So that's uh, within our potential. 
So now, of course, not everyone is going to do that, especially in our modern world. But still, there's a, we can go a long way because we have the potential for that. Why? Look, you know, we, nobody of us is born knowing how to read, to write, to solve mathematical equations, <laughs> uh, to play chess. We learned. We went to school for many, many years, and we did often also professional training in some kind. So even some kids don't like that, but somehow it's, it's well known in society that it's good to be educated. So by which kind of mystery, uh, basic human quality that's so important, like altruistic love, compassion, openness to others, you know, fairness, and, and so forth, the sense of common humanity and common sentience with other species, you know, eight other million species who are co-citizens in this world, how come they will be either at the top right from the beginning or they will be whatever we have and they're unchangeable? That makes no sense. Every other skill, every other faculty, every other capacity, uh, we start with a certain level and there's always a big margin of change, of training. So there's no reason why those fundamental human quality would escape that general nature of things. So we will not become all of, say, Olympic champions of compassion, but compared to what we start as a huge margin, and that we can bring that to optimal state according to our capacity. And if you really go in the Buddhist scripture, actually we have much more capacity than we think, because it's always possible to remove all the obscuration and somehow at a point to actualize the Buddha nature. So when this is known, then it will be sad not to do what's necessary to actualize this potential. So that's why we consider that being born as a human, that we can think about that, we can decide to embark on the path, and we can decide that we want to achieve inner freedom. We want to get rid of that and not just for ourselves, but gain the capacity that through that we will be able also to help others get out of suffering. So that's the ideal of the Bodhisattva. The goal of achieving Buddhahood is not just to achieve Buddhahood and rest in a kind of a peaceful, you know, nice nirvana floating on a cloud or staying in bed all day in a state of bliss. It is to achieve Buddhahood so that we gain the faculty to free all beings from suffering. So it's, a, it's of course, a huge... Uh, task. But why not setting a big task? You know, if you say, oh, I'm only going to go from here to the train station. Well, you'll get there and, and so what? If you say, I'm going to go around the world, you also will get to the train station, but your journey will not stop there. So just to go to the train station is okay. I'm only interested in my own fate. I have nothing against the happiness of others, but that's not my job. So that's a very limited goal and you get a limited result. But if you include at least in your mind the removing the suffering of all sentient beings, well, the journey is very long, but at least every step of the journey is worth traveling, is worth doing. It brings immense gratification. So that is why somehow if we do change as individual, then we do have much more capacity to contribute to change the world. So in a way, becoming a better human being so that we can better serve others, better transform the world. Now, among all those qualities, you know, I would argue, and that's what I was much inspired, of course, by this holiness, who for the last you know, 20, 30 years, of course, when he would give Buddhist teachings, he would go very much in depth in very complex, issues, and we know that as translator, that sometimes can be very challenging. But in public talks, clearly, it's compassion all over. And I remember once I was doing one year retreat, I think it was in 2006. And my, then I had to stop for one month in the year because my father was dying. So I, I accompanied for the last three weeks in the hospital with him. And I had to translate for his holiness in Belgium. So I went there 
And uh, since my father had passed away and I saw his holiness, and then I told him, I'm going back into retreat for another six months. Do you have any advice? And he says, in the beginning, meditate on compassion. In the middle, meditate on compassion. In the end, meditate on compassion. So message was clear. So now I thought, you know, how to translate that into a way that we can together using many walks of life, you know, philosophers, scientists, social workers, activists, politicians, economists, you know, investors, scientists on the, on the environment. How could we sit around a table and work together for a better world? Now, who would not want a better world? So now we need a, a concept. Now, there are mothers in Africa that need to feed their kids for the next five days. You know, how can you tell them, you know, just protect the environment, don't do this, don't do that. You know, for them, it's emergency. So that's a sh very short-term preoccupation. And they really matter to so many people in this world, or people in, a, in co conflict and war zone, as there's unfortunately so many now. Men is to survive for themselves and their family and their society around. So now, but there's also the midterm, you know, a generation, a family, uh, a lifetime. And what is our main aspiration in that is to, to thrive, to flourish in life, to that our basic uh, aspiration can be fulfilled so that at the end of our life, we say, well, it was worth living this life. I did my best. And I, I was quite fortunate to go through this life. You know, it's a natural aspiration that we should help everyone to fulfill. But there's also a new dimension now. You know, like 12,000 years ago, we were only about one to five million on Earth. So it seems that already then, those five million managed to eradicate most of the huge species because they hunted them. But still, you know, they could only throw things and the power they had on the world was sort of quite limited. Now, 10,000 years later, there was the industrial revolution, scientific revolution, technological revolution, and now we are waiting even for more with artificial intelligence and all that. Our power has been increased 10,000 fold, if not more. But, you know, our care for others didn't follow that much. So we were sort of, nobody has decided to wreck the world and spoil the oceans and biodiversity and cause three degrees of global warming very soon. So there's a dilution of responsibility because it came over a century with a great acceleration in the 1950s and so forth. But it is real. And so we have also now to think of the fate of future generation because their fate is in our hand. And they will say, you knew and you did nothing. That's terrible. Of course, we won't probably be there to hear that, but certainly they will immensely suffer because of our action. So some philosopher, mostly from the United States, say, well, future generation don't have rights. Because to have a right, you have to be aware of it and you have to reciprocate. Well, that's a very individualistic conception of, of rights. Because they have a natural right, every sentient beings have a natural right not to unnecessarily suffer if that suffering can be avoided or by the actions of others. So we are clearly the cause of immeasurable suffering for billions and billions of beings to come. So that's a new responsibility. So now, again, we are sitting around the table. There is uh, environmental scientists, social worker, politician, investors, and so forth and so forth. What kind of concept can allow us to work together? Well, selfishness will not do the job. You know, my favorite Marxist is Groucho Marx. Well, not many people know about Groucho Marx these days, but he said, why should I care for future generation? Because what did they do for me? So 
I heard American billionaire Stephen Forbes saying the same thing basically on Fox News. And I wrote it down right after that. He was told about the rays of the oceans in 100 years. And that would be dramatic consequences. And he said, I find absurd to change my behavior now for something happening in 100 years. That means he's probably, I'm sure, I'm sure he has children and grandchildren. So that's the serious version of Groucho Marx. So selfishness will not do the job. You have no interest in helping a mother in Africa to care for poverty in the midst of plenty, for social justice, if you can get around that and be a free rider and be very rich and put on the air conditioner and don't care about others. So there's only one concept that can reunite those three time scale and allow all these people to work together. And that's a concept that we can cultivate as a skill, as an individual. And by cultivating as an individual, when there's a critical mass, then society can change, institution can change. And that concept is having more consideration for others. It's another way of saying altruism, benevolence, compassion, whatever you say. You know, in Buddhism, we say that loving altruistic love is wishing that others find happiness and the cause of happiness. And compassion is the same thing, but towards suffering, may the suffering and the cause of suffering be removed in all sentient beings. So it's mostly unconditional love applied to a particular case of suffering. So having more consideration for others that you will have a caring economics that is at the service of society and not society at the service of economy. You will have more social justice. You will not have 10 people who owns today as much as the 25% poorest in the world. You know, a few, two, three years ago, when the, I think it's uh, one of those, Jeff Bezos went for five minutes in space with few friends. It cost $5 billion. It was calculated that with that, he could have put in school most of the kids in the world that are not in school, just to enjoy five minutes and make a lot of fuss about it. So that's not decent. That's not consideration for others. So we need, I have a question for others, we will have social justice, we'll care for poverty in the midst of plenty. And then in the midterm, we will provide the condition in society that everyone can thrive. Everyone can fulfill their basic aspirations. And then if we care for future uh, generation, we will try to slow down our sort of this, the, the way we treat the planet and biodiversity. You now we are running toward the fifth great extinction of species. The oceans are, all the corals are dying. You know, one of our friends here, good friend is a specialist of the oceans. Actually, it's not the oceans, it's one big ocean. They're all interconnected and everything is interconnected through interdependence in the biodiversity. So definitely, we need to start with cultivating altruism and compassion in our heart. And it is possible because we know from contemplative science that if we start seriously over the years, we can change. And neuroscience tells you that the brain is plastic and you change. So it's not a sudden change. Many teachers say that, you know, if you have a big change from one day to the other, it's a bit suspicious. It's like fireworks, it will fall down. Real change is slowly over time, but in a stable way, irreversible way, you change. You know, in the railway station, you have those big clocks. If you stare at it, it seems they're not moving, the, the big harm of the clocks. But if you look every 10 minutes, oh, it has moved. So real change takes a lot of effort, but it's very worth it. I remember once I was asked to speak at the India Today Conclave. India Today is a, one of the most common weekly magazine in India. So there was an interviewer and she asked me, can you tell us the three secrets of happiness in three weeks? So I told her, there's no secret. There's no three points. This doesn't take three weeks, but the whole life, 
but that's the best thing you can do. So yes, we can change day after day, thought after thought, emotion after emotion, mood after mood, and eventually we can become a better human being. So the more of us do that, the more chance we have to change the world together through the interdependence, because our happiness and suffering can only be built with and through others. That's the basic principle of interdependence. Nothing works with, we are not small units that sometimes interact like uh, snooker balls. We are, there's no such thing as a successful selfish happiness. It doesn't work by nature because we are not isolated entities. So we need to be aware of that, what the Saint Dalai Lama speak, the universal of responsibility. So we need to combine a very strong and determined personal commitment to change ourselves and to contribute to change the world and keeping that in the big picture of universal responsibility because we're all interconnected. So in this way, individual change and cultural change and global change are like the two blades of a knife that keep on sharpening each other. More individual change, they change the culture, they change the institution, they change the world. New people who come in this new culture, uh, somehow will grow in a different environment, they, con they will continue the change. Now, obviously, you might say, well, that's a very beautiful, but quite a utopian idea. If we see the, uh, what the situation in the world, of course, there are many contrary forces. But, uh, you know, sometimes I think that, you know, evolution uh, selects traits that are good for our survival. And if there's one trait that evolution <laughs> might select for our survival, it will be cooperation, not uh, exacerbated individualism and narcissism and so forth. So let's hope that not only we can awake to this importance of personal change towards becoming a better human being to better serve others, and also that evolution will, go, will give us a little help by counter-selecting free riders, selfish, mean people, because they're definitely not good for the survival of human species and for the, of course, the 8 million other species, as I mentioned, which are our co-citizens in this world because our fate is intimately linked. You know, if, if we go to the fifth extension of species, it's not just some rare species disappearing. It's going to fundamentally make a completely different world and human life will be also deeply affected by that. It's not just a few rare species of frogs or fish that will disappear. The whole biosphere will change if we uh, uh, impoverish biodiversity to such extent. So, you know, specialists of, uh, of, uh, of the environment, you know, at the Mind and Life Conference on Power and Care, we had invited Joan Rockstrom, who is now uh, in Germany, I believe. He was in Sweden before. And he says, uh, recently I had a talk with him, and he says we have a se seven or eight years, but this very small, narrow window. We can do it, but at certain cost. You know, we really have drastically to change our way of life toward sort of a happy simplicity. We need to do better with less instead of worse with more. So that's the challenge we have. So basically, you know, that a few ideas I wanted to share with you a little bit in disorder uh, about how both uh, individual change and changing the society, changing institution and changing the world are going together. So yes, yeah, sorry to be a bit confusing, but you know, I'm getting old. So as, as one of my friends said, nothing left in the right side and nothing right in the left side but I try my best. And if you have some question, I'd be most happy to entertain them. Sorry, I spoke too long. Just one more thing, uh, yeah. Christophe. No, you said to put it in action. 
So I remember when I did the book Monk and Philosopher, you know, I was 25 years very quiet in, in India studying and doing practice and I didn't expect to come back. <clears throat> then this book Monk and Philosopher completely changed. I didn't want to do that basically, but when it happened, then suddenly, you know, I was thrown away again in the modern world. And uh, so I thought, well, before I could see all the issues and the difficulties people were having in extreme poverty and so forth. But I had not, no way I could do anything. I was living on like equivalent of less than 100 euros a month as it was possible in India at that time. But when the, the Merkant philosopher came and I didn't, I didn't need the royalties and I didn't need any of those. So I decided to start Karuna session and do some projects. So we, over 20, now we are uh, celebrating 25 years in 2025. So today, uh, as it grew slowly, 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 we are helping 500,000 people every year uh, in India, Nepal, and Tibet is very challenging, but we still manage. And we have a wonderful team. There's 200 people working in India, 50 in Nepal. There's a whole team in Paris. So it's doing very well. So I think this is a you know, show that if we are really dedicated, something can happen. And if more people do like that, it's possible. So, yeah, so thank you so much for having mentioned that.